Welcome to ARTV. I'm your host, Morgan Ray, and today we bring you an exhibition exclusive. On episode 17, we went to the Linden New Art Gallery and something has changed. We have artist Ash Keating here to tell us what has happened. Ash, welcome to the show. Hi, Morgan. Thank you for having me. Thank you yeah. for joining us. So, with duality, it's now fall. Now, it, it didn't fall, right? But what, what exactly has happened to your exhibition? I, th I think with institutions, you often get like a three month exhibition duration. And for myself, when I was creating these works in late 2020, I thought about creating two bodies of work and at the halfway point of the show, changing over the exhibition entirely. So I made two contrasting bodies of work. The first being Ariel, which is called Ariel because it's a distant, light look at an aerial kind of landscape made of uh, textures, including perlite and polymers uh, and mica flakes. Now with the contrasting body of work, I used vermiculite and glass beads mixed with polymers and in an autumnal color shift. Uh, it just so happens that the changeover of the exhibition is the changeover of the seasons uh, of autumn. And that's kind of, in a nutshell, I guess, the, the reasoning and the changeover of the exhibition. And it's a vast difference from what we originally saw. Um, what was the reason for this besides the seasonal change? Um, you had started with this body of work first, correct? Yes, I created uh, work which is quite textured using vermiculite and uh, paint to build up the texture underneath the surface. Uh, so I created those works, put them aside, they were quite dark, they looked almost like bitumen, and then I worked on the aerial series. Uh, and then when I came back to these works, I knew I wanted to incorporate um, more texture in a different way than I'd previously worked. And I guess um, the idea for the glass beads came from a trip to New York in 2018. I went and saw uh, an exhibition at the Whitney by Mary Corse, and she uses a lot of she used a lot of uh, reflective beads in her um, often translucent pearlescent white works. Um, and they were quite amazing, the colour shift just in with those minimal pearlescent whites. And together with also seeing an exhibition by Jack Whitten at the Met Brewer, I was very interested in bringing texture back into my work at some point. So with the pandemic and the lockdowns in Melbourne through 2020, my Linden exhibition was pushed back, a few other exhibitions were pushed back. And I used that opportunity to I guess, shift my art practice in a different way. Uh, not to say I wouldn't be working like I had been in the past, which is a very soft uh, gravity drip process of lots of water and paint creating quite in-depth uh, fall-based kind of works. However, I wanted to create new, a new direction, I guess, and that's what this body of work is. And some would say this is quite risky to take a whole new direction from what you've traditionally done as an artist. What are some of the, like how does this even funded? Sure, I mean, most of, it's a low fee, I guess, with the institution. And for myself, it's, uh, it's supported by the people that, um, that, uh, that help me and my manager, David Hager. He's offered a lot more time um, on this show because he's passionate about my practice. My uh, people that uh, supply my art materials, um, be it the art stretches or the pigments with Chapman and Bailey and Langridge, they have given everything to me at cost, whereas mm -hmm. um, because they, they know that it's uh, great to be able to um, support artists um, shifting and changing the way that they work and experimenting. And for myself, I've still got a steady uh, income through a lot of my outdoor public works and selling my well-known gravity drip works. So primarily, I guess, I've, I'm funding the change of direction in my practice through my existing practice that I've built to this point. Oh, great. Yeah. Now, what would kind of advice would you give to artists that are wanting to get out into the professional world of being an artist? What do you suggest for them? Uh, well, I mean, it's, there's so many different 
uh, things to be uh, like hi hyper aware of in this time. I guess more than anything, it's not being afraid to put your work out there. Uh, I've always documented my work very well uh, and a lot of that comes down to investing in other people to document my work for me. So I guess I, I would recommend uh, very early documenting everything you do very well and getting other people to document the process of what you do. You understand a lot more about what you're making and what you're putting out there into the world as well. Uh, every single artwork I photographed um, properly as an archive. So I guess it's a simple thing to kind of, um, I guess, well, it's, it's one, one aspect of the business of being an artist, but it's very important to archive your work because for me, I'm thinking long term about um, uh, catalogs, uh, catalog raisons of every work I make, books, um, <laughs> and also, in, in the moment, I'm always, always putting interesting images out there for my audience. Sure, you have quite a following on Instagram and these lovely photos of you in the process. Um, when were these taken? Uh, so those images probably were taken um, mid-December when I was working on these works through December. and. Dan Preston took those images, um, who takes a lot of images for me. I've got a few photographers that work with me. Matthew Stanton takes my artwork photography. And often, I guess, it is a little daunting um, allowing a photographer into your workspace uh, when you're making work. And for me, it's always stressful, actually, because I don't want to let it uh, affect the uh, fluidity and direction that I want to take with my work and that the work allows me to take. Uh, so it's, it's often something that is like necessary but not necessarily comfortable. Sure, to invite someone into your private yes. space. Now, I love when you talk about documentation and you brought some examples of even the boots that you've worn. Sure. Do you do this for every work that you do, like save the, <laughs> the boots? No. Well, actually, I think that the, the boots, were, that was the first time I was working with boots in the studio. You can see in the image at the end of the, uh, the canvases, there's a tray which collects a lot of the water that I spray on my works. And so when I'm getting in behind the works and um, working from behind, that trough is filled with water. So I had the boots on for that. And then after, after that, I started working with these glass beads, pouring them into buckets um, and mixing, mixing the water, um, paint and beads into buckets thickening it up and then just flicking it onto the canvas. And this is a way that I hadn't worked before. And the more I kind of did it, the more I got comfortable with it, and the smaller little droplets would come out and I'd flick them down the length of the canvas. And ultimately they'd sort of, it ended up all over my boots as well. And it's kind of nice to keep them like that. Nice dark black boots, they kind of color really pops. <laughs> so, you know. I might not use them again, they're kind of too good now. <laughs> no, they look like a work of art themselves. And it's so lovely seeing the pieces here, the light is reflecting off the glass particles. And you spoke about this being um, almost an improvisational style of work, correct? For sure. I mean, most of the painting that I do is improvised. However, uh, you know, 90% of preparation and selecting colors it's all quite thought out. Um, it's still quite improvised in terms of the way that I would mix certain uh, certain tints of color. It's all done on the on the go. Um, but yeah, I guess I guess that's improvised in a way too. I mean, there's nothing too over thought out about the way that I work. I kind of work with one layer of paint and one color that leads to the next, and more than anything, it's the composition that is improvised. And I feel like one mark leads to the next, which 
then leads to the next. And then slowly you've got to work out when you want to abandon the work or kind of feel like it's sort of uh, finished, I guess. Now, have you ever had one of those moments where you were like, oh my gosh, what just happened? In terms of going too Like it far? scared you a bit? Or like, you know, if a friend came over and something happened to a piece? Oh, like in terms of like the art making process and taking it too far, I've always like done that. And you learn from that. You learn from, um, I guess, taking the work into a place that's not necessarily the best or not, not necessarily better than where it was, you know, a few layers before that. And if you keep painting, it might not get to where it was. So you do, I, I often talk about with friends or other fellow artists about mourning the loss of previous paintings in previous layers. Ah. Um, and that happens, you know, but and so often you've got to be quite kind of content with where a painting might be, even if you think it might be able to be going in a better direction. I think like sometimes you're like, that's fine. That's, that's good where it is. I'll, I'll leave that in there. But um, yeah, I think it's more, it's something that kind of happens more on a bigger scale for me. Uh, when I'm working on large scale extinguisher paintings and there is deadlines, you've got to get paintings done within a day and there's multiple layers involved. A lot of water um, I use in terms of with the paint and actually while the painting is moving a lot um, with the water, like I would love to be able to kind of arrest the painting at a certain point but you know it just keeps on moving and creating and rests in a certain way. Uh, in the studio, not on a vertical wall, I can often put an, a painting on a deeper angle after I've had it vertical, like I'm, I'm doing here. That's not what I'm actually working on there, but I, I can, I'm just sort of wetting the surface in that image to put pigment on. Uh, but I guess with, with the process in the studio, I can lift at different angles and then bring down to a certain angle when I'm happy with where the painting is, and then that will kind of um, dry as you see it. Whereas with walls, things look great in the moment and then they might just kind of keep drawing down and, and becoming more sort of, I guess, gravity drip based. Sure, yeah. thanks for sharing that with us. Now, right. the exhibition at Linden New Art that ends May 16th. So yeah. we want to get everybody there. For sure, yeah. So there's a month more of the show. Um, it's open every day except Monday. Uh, 11 till 4 I think and um, yeah I think if you if you walk around the space you really feel immersed in the work and the scale of the the larger works in the main space of Linden um, they're made site specifically to that space they fit in with the floor they contrast with the old Victorian architecture as well so a lot of my work is always thought about in terms of where I'm showing the work as well, like, and equally, they exist as works that can operate outside of that space as well. Right, so what happens to the pieces when it's over? Uh, well, in my studio, I've got storage for large works, and they'll go back into there, into storage, and maybe shown at a later date somewhere else. But uh, for myself, I guess working on this scale is easier now. I have a large-scale studio and storage. Well, thank you for bringing your studio to us. Um, we'll have to stop by the Linda New Art Gallery and see the big changes of fall. Um, so thanks for joining us so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. That's great. That was ARTV's exclusive exhibition. Thanks for joining us. See you next time. <laughs>